Welcome everybody, welcome everybody to watching online. Um, we're here at the MEN News offices in Manchester, and thanks a lot to them. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking to the Catalyst authors. There's three of them here, one of them virtually here, which is uh, KD sort of very black in the corner here. This is Jess Robinson, um, she works for Sophos, Matt, Matt Trout, who works for Shadowcat Systems, and Kieran Dement, who is a sort of roving researcher for the guide, aren't you? Yes, that's right. <laughs> So and the guy talking, talking is Rob Keating, who also works for Shadow Cat, and is too shy to introduce himself. So anyway. I am. We're going to be talking about this book, and um, we just lost KD, which is the Definitive Guide to Catalyst, writing extensible, scalable, and maintainable pearl based web applications. We also have a pingo. Excellent. Where's the pingo? And um, we've lost KD for now. <laughs> so we'll start by talking to these two. Um, right, okay. Well, First of all, somebody going to give us a synopsis for the book? Um, all the things that it drove us insane that various newbies trying to get their head around Catalyst didn't know, put together into a sensible chunk of things by, um, well, largely by people who can actually write with a little bit of help from me. Okay, Kieran, we'll do the synopsis of the book. Matt was, um, this is a book written by people not him. Could you give a synopsis of the book? Um, okay, so I guess what I wanted to do was not so much write a tutorial how-to guide as a sort of set of concepts of the sort of things that I picked up over a period of time that kind of useful, treat, useful techniques as opposed to concentrating on technique rather than process. So what you, the things that you need to understand in order to be able to use calculus not enough people know about. That's right. Uh, I gather you also tried to write the book in a slightly different way than other technical books have been written in the past. In what way? Um, just in your approach. Uh, uh, yeah, well that's sort of what like I'm saying, high level conceptual stuff rather than, um, rather than just a uh, step by step process procedure. You know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of technical books seem to sort of stick to procedural learning. And um, uh, you could see with the previous Catalyst book that it went out of date very, very quickly, and I wanted to avoid that. And Catalyst is, you know, even though it's very stable, it's a bit of a moving target. So my goal was to keep, um, like, my goal was to try and keep it uh, sort of simple, simply structured simply enough that when sort of small components change, like we're starting to see more emphasis on roles now, um, but we don't cover that a whole lot. Um, that that should be simple to put into a second edition. Um, so that you know the books are written to have a bit more longevity. An obsession with backwards compatibility doesn't mean that um, best practices aren't still a moving target. So a lot of it was focusing on why you do particular things rather than specifically what you do. Um, and we tried to take you through the um, way that all of us think through what we're doing on the writing applications, rather than just showing you what bits of code to put where to write an application. Okay, the next question I, I guess Kieran's going to go for first is, um, how hard was it to convince the publishers to print a book about Catalyst? Well, they approached me. Um, <laughs> so not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody <laughs> easy. <laughs> somebody published the sales figures for the previous book about that. <laughs> well, when I spoke to the editor, he said the sales figures for the previous good book, book were pretty good for a package book. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you think a press are going to do more books on, on pill? Or on pill modules, libraries, projects? I don't know. I think that um, the, the 
the, 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 the field is quite, um, you know, it's a declining, it's a declining area. Um, I, I don't quite know how you solve that problem. Um, Catalyst is quite lucky that it's got really good community documentation because it's quite a large project. Well, APRES seem to be solving it by getting um, Jay Curry, one of the authors of um, the Catalyst book, to write a um, Pearl for, from Absolute Beginner Level Up book, which is hopefully going to be coming out in a few months. Okay. Yes, I don't know what state that's in, but um, I'm not looking forward to seeing it. And I've sort of volunteered somebody to technically review it. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of subjects are they covering for that? I don't know, ask JK. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask each of you in order. Matt, you first. How hard was it to write this book? Um, it wasn't so much hard as unbelievably <coughs> slow for me. Um, well, also hard, but uh, fundamentally beat head against wall until either uh, words come out or you bleed and fall over <laughs> and repeat and repeat and then go. KD, I'm an awful author. Could you take another bit of the text to write, please? Because, uh, help. Um, fortunately, um, KD turned out to be, a, for reasons I don't entirely understand, silly enough to be a willing victim for most of this. Um, which not only meant the book came out on time, but most of it was written by people who could write better than I could. So, Jess? I don't find the actual writing was hard. I think a lot of the you know, running around, reviewing, waiting for things to happen in between is the hard bit. So you, you write something and then you send it off and the reviewers come back. And they're, they're very good reviewers and they come back and said, well, you know, from the point of view of not having a clue what you started with, you know, this this don't make sense and, and these bits need revising to explain to a first time person coming to your book, you know, what's going on. So it was actually quite helpful for me to find out, you know, things to write, things that I need to write in order to show people, you know, that haven't been to the subject before. Where you know that are coming straight to the the new the new piece, so the actual writing I think is fine. It's it's all the running around. It's a bit sort of waiting. You know, you do this in a rush, and then you send stuff off, and the rules come back, and the Sunday it's can you get this back tomorrow, kind of thing. So that's a bit tricky, but I guess that happens in all the, all these sorts of things. And finally, off to Kieran. How how hard was it to write? And um, motivation as well. How hard was oh, it to I get motivated? Do, I didn't do much else for about six months apart from turn up to my new job and make sure I wasn't getting behind on that and write this book. So I didn't really have much of a life for six months. But I, you know, I kind of coordinated the whole thing more so than everybody else. I'm probably responsible for about two thirds to three quarters of the book, and then I looked, looked after most of the review process afterwards. But um, yeah, so I didn't really do much for quite some time apart from right um, and I'm not doing that again for a while um, <laughs> the, yeah, my, my approach is to in fact it happened a couple of times so just to write effectively you've just got to be prepared to write any old crap for uh, you know as a first draft and then be prepared to throw that away and there were a couple of instances where I've had that to throw, throw away uh, so anywhere between two and five thousand words start all over again. Um, so, but the yeah, if you, so long as you write something, having a page that's not blank is a lot easier to deal with than yeah. a page that is blank. So, um, yeah, but like I say, I, I, I didn't do much. Um, I, I didn't do very much at all apart from write and go to work for a six month period, really. <laughs> no, 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 really. Which is a bit painful. It's just a bit painful, but I'm, you know, I'm not totally turned off the process, so, so I'll, do it. I'll do it again at some point. Oh, well, that's good. I thought I heard him volunteer to do something there. <laughs> I think we have no, that. It's got no, on no, camera, no. <laughs> Okay, uh, the book is actually aimed at people with pretty much an intermediate knowledge, if not higher, in Pearl, and certainly a, a knowledge of Catalyst. Um, how much do you think can be gained on it from an intermediate knowledge in another dynamic language or in another framework? Or how much use is it to say a novice or casual reader? Well, we've had several. The beginning people. part. I've, I've handed the beginning part, of the, the first couple of chapters of the book, over to a couple of people on the grounds that it will help them understand some of their work better. Um, designers or um, programmers from non web areas. Um, so the first, first 60 pages are probably quite useful. Um, for people that you described, I think. Uh, 
We actually had several people say that they found the um, stuff at the beginning helped take them from vaguely remembering sort of basic CGI style Pearl to the um, new world of Moose where um, Pearl is sort of like Ruby but with a usable object system. Um, and the other thing is there were a couple of people who said that they um, felt that the uh, book in its emphasis on testing as you go along and showing how to do that and the discussions about um, thinking about design and separation of concerns. It not only did things not enough people know about um, from a point of view of Catalyst but from a point of view of Perl application development um, on the whole. Um, and uh, Dave Cross uh, of London Pearlmongers and the uh, Magnum Solutions training company said that in his review. And um, so did Tom Hookins, who's the uh, Milton Keynes Pearlmongers leader. And quite frankly, I didn't realise we'd managed to achieve that, but um, they're both smart guys and seem to think we did. So you may wish to take their word for it and have a read of it, even if you're not expecting to um, look at it in a direct fashion. Okay, I'm going to give you a quote. Hopefully that'll be good for sales as well. <laughs> I'm going to give you a quote now. Uh, this is Tommy, this is um, Os Pameron, so you can blame him. The Perl web framework Catalyst has, and I'm fairly sure that he's common with many such frameworks in any programming language, a concept of a store of data, scope to the current request called the stash. I've mentioned a few times that I don't like it, and the reaction I get suggests that I don't understand it. So, I, it's a good time for me to be ignorant in public to some very clever people that do understand. Can you tell me what I'm missing? Therefore, the stash is evil, disgust. You can kill him later. <laughs> the, the problem with the stash is that initially it was basically used as this is where we stuff the data that the template's going to use to render the view. And it works basically fine as that, but then we ended up in a situation of separating code out so you have methods calling other methods calling other methods and the catalyst dispatch cycle especially you know. hello hello i don't know what happened there the, um, i missed a lot of that quote unfortunately you dropped it out on our way through um, i'll give you back to you again in a second matt was just finishing answering what he was saying about it the um, begin all to an end stuff and chain means that you've got independently called methods that need to be able to share data somehow. And the stash so far has proven the um, least worst way of doing it. Um, I'm not honestly claiming that the stash is a great idea. I'm saying that it, it, it is not that bad overloading it um, for inter-controller communication as well as for the, uh, rendering the view. Um, I'd, I'd quite like to see a more elegant way of doing both of those, but um, we've so far, I've come up with a few ideas, but they generally turned out to be um, too much more verbose to actually justify the improvements. Uh, we've, we regularly have people saying, well, why don't we add per request attributes to the controllers? At which point you have the problem of the controllers actually being a per application object, so once you have things that depend on the request, you've now got an incomplete object, which is a brain-bending concept and just um, doesn't fit with the paradigm at all. I, I, I do occasionally wonder if having just a per-request controller full stop and some sort of factory object might work, but I'm not convinced that that won't be more typing than it's worth. Um, and every time we make things um, cleaner and more carefully separated, and nicer for the this architectural pat pattern of crap and evil people. A um, hundred newbies complain that they now have to type two extra lines of code and it's much more work to just get the application up and get out of work into the pub. So I'm not sure where the balance is between beautiful and done and down the pub yet. Okay, I'm going to repeat the quote for you because uh, <coughs> Kieran, 
there's been some, been some requests for Kieran to cover up his, um, his window yeah. at the back. Oh, that's you what, cover that's up your window at the back, apparently? I'll sit in front of it or something. Um, it's oh, sure. actually a lot more visible on the screen here. I think it yeah. also may be okay. lights onto this. I can't see him. No. <laughs> <laughs> Fail. <laughs> there we go. Better? Somewhat. It's that nasty Stop. upside down light they get over there in Australia. <laughs> if you shift over to your left, you'll block out the light. It's a dirty day here. There we go. There we go. <laughs> yeah, it's a very dirty morning here. No, no, you're completely invisible on the screen, that's great. <laughs> I don't know why people requested this, but they did. <laughs> they didn't want to see you. <laughs> they obviously just didn't want to look at you. The Perl Web Framework Catalyst has, and I'm fairly sure that it's common with many such frameworks in any programming language, a concept of a store of data scope to the current request, called the stash. I've mentioned a few times that I don't like it, and the reaction I get suggests that I don't understand it. So it is a good time for me to be ignorant in public, and for some clever people that do understand it, can tell me what I'm missing. The stash is evil. Discuss. Okay. Um, I can't avoid thinking about that, technical things like that. <laughs> good answer. <laughs> 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 That's actually better, I can see you better now. Good. Um, okay. People on the internet probably can't. <coughs> yeah, well, screw that. <laughs> the internet's not for watching. Have they asked any questions yet? Yeah. 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 You can comment on the, on the video pitch to you. And then question. eventually when I need to think about something technical, I'll start reading the tests in the source code, or reading the documentation, or if the documentation's inadequate, then reading the tests and trying to crib directly off the text, not the tests. And not thinking, I'm try, really trying not to think about the implementation kind of issues, just think about what it's being exposed to me as a user. So, which is, you know, probably a different approach to many programs, but I don't actually spend that much time thinking about programming kind of issues. So, um, it works for me. Okay. Which is possibly why we've got a good mix of, um, a good mix of descriptive and technical stuff in the book, because um, I'm responsible for this two-thirds of it being a descriptive approach and then there's people with better technical ideas supporting that approach. Now, the next question is in two parts. First of all, was uh, Ostrom Ron's rather interesting question followed by mine. His question is, why does your book seep into my feeble brain by osmosis? This is the future, damn it, where's my flying car? <laughs> <laughs> so my, my question, which is a bit more sensible, is why should Ostrom Ron get off his ass and read the, your book that he's actually bought? I'm going to let Jess answer that first. Um, well, actually, it's a good question. I mean, for Osvaldo himself, I think he actually knows enough Catalyst maybe not to need to go and read the whole thing through. It kind of depends on who picks the thing up. Um, if it's somebody who, who's just starting out in Perl and Catalyst, then they really want to start trying the book, at least from the beginning, the first few chapters, to get into what the idea is about, and then they can pick and choose you know, which parts they're going to need and look at the complete applications and examples to um, find out which bits they want to read. And we'd rather they read the book than come and bother us on the channel, because we're only going to say go to buy the book anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and when they've read the book, they can come back and ask questions. That's yeah, I don't think I've ever seen that. <coughs> really? Uh, you, you want to, to, to know it cast away enough then? <laughs> it, it, it clearly is. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, in the case of Os Famron, he should sit down and read it because he's currently in Edinburgh and bored. <laughs> I know that he's currently in Edinburgh on board because he contacted me on IRC earlier today apologising for not being here, telling me he was in Edinburgh on board and also that the reason he's bored is because he forgot to take the book with him. <laughs> you can buy another one then. Well, you can buy second one, can't you? <laughs> More profits. Yep. Uh, it's a way of reading the book is to read the introductory paragraph for each chapter and then read the index. Yep. So the index is as good as it could be, which is a resources kind of issue um, with the technical publishing mark. Um, you know, the index was done in a hurry and with not the manpower or the experience. Of people, people, people. I don't think. 
I've certainly not compiled an index before, and the person who compiled the index didn't have the technical knowledge. Yeah, I'm speaking as a person who has compiled an index. Understand what was relevant in the index. So, you know, it's not as good as it could be, but it's not appalling either. The information's there. Um, but it would help to read the introductory paragraph for each chapter before referring to the index. Yeah. When I use it, it's quite handy for me because I have a pretty good idea of where everything is, so the index is a bit of a secondary thing for me. But, uh, I think I'm a special case. <laughs> okay, next question. So there's, there's two really, both pretty much the same. My organization uses PHP for the web front end, why should I switch? We're a rail, rail shop, why should we use Catalyst in any way or read the book? People have been asking me for years, how are you competing with Rails? And um, my answer has always been, well, we aren't really. If, if what you have is um, trivial crud, where the database is basically a dumb store, and your application owns the database, so you don't need any intelligent back-end logic in the code or in the database, and all you're really focusing on is doing um, complicated um, HTML bits on top of a very simple data structure. Well, For those who don't know, what's CRUD? Um, <laughs> create, read, update, delete, basically basic single record operations, the sort, of, <laughs> the sort of thing Maypole could um, handle usefully, uh, which was trying to compete with Rails very, very badly. But um, Catalyst is, is designed for applications that need to be flexible, that need to actually take advantage of the database, um, as opposed to Rails Active Record, which unlocks all the power of MySQL 3.23. Um, and where you've got non-database models and you need different views onto the data. Um, Catalyst is designed to handle projects where you have 100 models, 100 controllers, um, and possibly more database tables than that. Um, and it's, desi it's designed to handle much smaller projects as well, but the, the, the point is to give you the flexibility to go that far if you need to. Uh, I, I know that there are some shops where um, they actually use Rails for the uh, trivial stuff and Catalyst where they actually have interesting business logic and get on very well there. Um, I was uh, talking to the um, Scriptaculous guy um, over at the Italian Pearl Workshop next week and he, he was basically agreeing that Rails isn't trying for that. If, if you need a complicated database, don't use Rails. Um, so I'm, I, I think the answer is it depends what you're trying to do. If you start hitting the pain points of a technology like Rails where you know you, you, you need a, a proper RM and a proper business layer or PHP where you find you need a programming language um, then Catalyst is usually a fairly interesting um, option to um, scale up to without getting into the um, XML tentacle horror that is most of the Java systems. Anybody want to add to that? I think there's often a, there's often a trade off for these things that you get all software that you have to learn is pain points. You either get pain points at the beginning or the end, things like PHP and Rails. You get the pain points at the end when it's too late. With Catalyst, you get the pain points at the beginning when you've got to start learning how to use it. But I always recommend Catalyst to people as a good, uh, and the kind of environment that I work, I recommend it as a way of a legacy system to glue, if you like. If you've got existing stuff that you need to glue together, then this is something that you should evaluate. But Perl's not very popular around where I am, so. It's a bit of a, um, bit of a, you know, we've got two employers in town. Um, one place, the university's Python PHP in this technical area, a bit of Java. Um, the uh, Steelworks is .NET. So I live in a small part of town where so my, my Perl advocacy is kind of a bit of a special case around here. There's not much Perl around here at all. Okay, and the next question is, um, how do you create a culture of documentation within an organization or a project? I think we should start with you on that one. <laughs> Ask me the difficult questions, eh? Yeah. Um, I think that's, in an organization, that's certainly very tricky. I mean, I know a lot of the stuff that I do at work, it's all at the beginning, you know, we need to write tests, we need to write documentation, we need to make sure we pass this on to support properly. And when you're at the very end of the project, that's always the bit that gets dropped, isn't it? We don't have time to do this, we'll do it later. And then later, of course doesn't happen. So I think what you need to do is get into something similar to like test-driven 
and develop, whereas not only do you write your tests as you go along, but you write your documentation as you go along, to, to try and plan your project so that while you're writing it, you could think at any point, I want to be able to hand this to somebody else, and they just get on with it. Yeah. I don't want to have to sit and explain to them what's going on, you know, what the pieces are involved, you know, who are the people I need to talk to. If you sit down and write all that stuff down as you go along, then maybe, maybe that's a good, re a good way to introduce it to an organisation, is to make them aware that if I just suddenly fall under a bus, if we've got a bus error, level of one, and then somebody else getting into that project will take, you know, weeks, because they have to figure out what the hell I was writing, then maybe that's a good way to, to introduce it. I think that'd be, that would be my way of thinking about it. I know it's really difficult because we have uh, the exact same problem at work all the time. It's like we'd love to have documentation, but you know, when do we do it? Matt? I'm my managers as well. Well, the, yeah. my approach to creating a culture of documentation has been. Yes. Get somebody else to do it. Yes. <laughs> 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 no, 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 that, no, that physical violence. That, that's, that's, that's causing documentation to actually make sense to people that um, Jess and Kieran are the DVX class and, spa and uh, catalyst specialists, respectively. Um, but one of the things that always, always strikes me is newbies are the best at poking holes in the docs and working out what needs documenting. So we've had a policy going back years now of the easiest way to buy stupid question credits on IRC is to write up the answers afterwards so that the next person actually finds the answer rather than having to ask the stupid question. Um, because once you've had the same question two or three times, it's, it's probably not a stupid question, it's just um, the author of the code is too used to it to be able to see that it's them being an idiot. Uh, I, I personally just assume I'm being an idiot um, and get people to send dot patches as much as humanly possible. Um, on the principle that if you can get them to send a doc patch and give them a commitment and put them on the contributors list and we don't make a distinction between documentation and code contributors um, on the list because you need both or a project is screwed um, or at least um, you know it's going to have about the same user base as oh I don't know plan 9 um, which was clearly documented by uh, people with my attitude to documentation um, as in undecipherable and great reference material, but nothing else. Uh, but the, the main thing is to remember, if there isn't documentation, people aren't going to be able to figure out how to use it. So people aren't going to use it. So it may be the most beautiful and brilliant piece of code on the planet, but unless you're basically planning to sit in your, to sit in your room at night masturbating over a printout of the source code, it's no use to man the base unless there's enough docs for other people to figure out what to do with it. <coughs> okay, any questions from anybody else in the, in the room? Oh, nothing online? Do all the uses people online? Can I talk about documentation quickly? Yeah, uh, yeah. When I got involved with Catalyst stuff, um, I looked at the, well, I was using my own problem before and I was quite recalcitrant about not learning something new that said it was more complicated. Um, and uh, I looked at, eventually got so frustrated with Maple understandably that I looked at Catalyst manual the tutorial and it didn't actually show me a complete working example. Um, so I think I, I found the IRC channel and complained about this briefly and then on a train trip up to Sydney, which is about an hour and a half from here, I finished it off so that you actually had a complete working example. Um, and I, I, can't, I think that made it into the source code briefly, but then Kennedy Clark started his work um, on uh, the big tutorial, which is a much better piece of work. I was just taking the minimal tutorial and completing it. So you find that's quite common, people assuming knowledge. So the, one of the big important things of getting a culture of documentation there is making sure that in order to get something working, you don't have to think about it. You know, you go through the, there's a principle called, an educational principle called cognitive load theory, um, which there's a Wikipedia page for, um, and which kind of t t it suggests that what you need to do is you need to make sure that your, your educational material, whatever it is, has a minimum extrinsic cognitive load. So you need to make sure that the, user, the, the, the end user is only thinking about the domain problem that you're interested in them learning, so you don't make them 
flick through pages and look at the diagram on page three while trying to read, read the paragraph on page 26 at the same time. So it's sort of like ergonomics of instructional material that minimizes the amount of external, minimizes the amount of the irrelevant thought that the end user has to make in order to be able to understand um, what they're trying to be told how to do. Very, we tried to do that a bit in the book. I don't know if we, if we, we, we succeeded particularly well, but I'm always trying to be conscious about I'm not making people think too much. You see that tendency a lot. So in a lot of Perl documentation, you see at the top, people not, you don't have to use strict and use warnings at the beginning of the synopsis because you know that's kind of taken as implicit, which is fine if you're in sort of my situation, but if you're not that much less experienced in programmer than me, um, you want that new strict and use warnings there so that you understand that you're, you know, it's going to interact with the existing workflow that you've got. You don't have to think about adding that kind of extra thing in so you don't have extra cognitive load imposed on you while you're trying to learn something new. Which is why I like reading tests as to the proxies for documentation because usually that is working code. Sometimes it's a little obscure, but um, or contrived, very often tested, very contrived, but um, that's certainly an excellent substitute for documentation. It is guaranteed working code, so guaranteed working code is the most important thing in the culture of producing stuff. <coughs> that so that you can blame the user at the end of the day rather than the person who wrote the documentation when things don't go right. This is less work for the author if they can blame the user as well. Yeah. Okay. Anybody want to add anything? The, the other comment from uh, online is uh, documentation is for wimps. Writing or reading? <laughs> uh, you, you can take that with Ben tomorrow, Jessica. That, that was best. <laughs> <laughs> I'll yeah. make him write the next letter. Looks like he's writing the best. Ben loves documentation. Okay, well, um, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, first of all, and by thanking uh, Kieran, easy. who is actually appearing I, very early in the I morning. One more question. Oh, one um, more question. In, in, in terms of Kieran's discussed documentation, um, when, when he's mentioned uh, actual with integration with tests, etc., is there actually a justifiable case for when the example documentation things are actually written to writing a test suite to go with the example documentation to make sure that the, all the example documentation works as you expect it to, so that when the user pulls <laughs> it, it works. Well, that was that's plan. we have 70-75% of the code in the book is available with tests, um, so we're certain that that works. Um, but obviously, mm -hmm. as new versions of Catalyst are released, um, that might change, so is that actually part of the test plan for Catalyst, or certainly a bolt-on that somebody's keeping an eye on? Uh, not currently, but then again, um, Catalyst test coverage and the level of backwards compatibility <coughs> that we maintain is uh, extremely high anyway. And one of the things we were very careful to do with the book was to not only use best practices, but to use things that were solid, everybody is using these features. <laughs> um, so even if there is some drift in Catalyst, I doubt it's actually going to happen. But the um, repository is out there, um, so checking out and running main tests on it occasionally isn't that difficult. Um, we've got the same with the Catalyst um, tutorial that's online. There, we actually keep a copy of that checked into the um, Subversion repository alongside Catalyst itself. Um, so you've always got that proof because you can pull whatever piece of code you're working on and check it work and check it looks the same as the repository and check that the copy in the repository does what you expect um, and then compare with your own. The, the only issue with using tests as a direct substitute or to test linking to test and documentation very, very closely is the tests that tend to be rather contrived. They, they, they don't really reflect the rich kind of use cases that you get in the real world, so you do need to put some effort into linking what happened in the test into the real world in a situation. Yeah, the, uh, the, the examples in the documentation can effectively form additional tests, but the code usages in the tests tend not to be useful to form examples for the documentation. So you'd have to write an extra set, which would mean a lot of boilerplate code to go around it to test them. It's a good idea though. I mean, you know, it'd be kind of hazardous on the ground. Well, um, 
since, since the, uh, the asker of that question was here, I'm going to say I've actually for a, the past year or two been thinking about how to write something nice that allows you to extract examples in documentation and assemble them automatically. So, um, well volunteered, and we'll talk about you releasing that later. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> any more? I'm not asking any more after that. <laughs> so, buy, buy this book, <laughs> if only to beat to death people who think documentation is for wimps. Because it's, it's heavy enough, it's got a nice thick spine. Did it, did it clarify that it was reading afterwards? Oh, it's reading the really oh, documentation. That's why the book is still sat at my desk after he's anything. <laughs> well, read the book. <laughs> I, well, I, I usually um, learn things by reading the source code rather than the documentation, but that, that's kind of my force of habit. Um, I, w I would suggest to anybody who thinks reading documentation is for wimps that they try and work out um, <laughs> how to use uh, the catalyst chain dispatch type by reading lib slash catalyst slash dispatch type slash chain dot pm catalyst distribution. And they go quietly mad. If they can come back if they can come back and give me a full explanation of exactly what it does, um, only from reading the source code of that, then I'll admit that they don't need to read the docs. But they can become the maintainer. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what happened to the last guy, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to thank uh, Kieran first. Kieran's joined us very, very early in the morning. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Oh, it's eight, so it's, it's not that early. Um, don't have time to go surfing today. Right, but thanks for joining us anyway. Um, to Jess Robinson, who showed us all the way 300 miles she drove today and then got lost. Several times. Um, for joining us all the way just for this evening. And of course to Matt, uh, who joins us all the time. We can't get rid of him, but we don't really want to. We sort of like him. Um, my name is Mark Keating and Manchester Evening News, thank you very, very much. Buy their papers, go to their website, these guys are awesome. Click on the ads. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> click, click on the ads. Oh, thank you.